national shows and events and we're very honored to have her here on Mud Matters and this is our second podcast um, where the aim is to focus on professional development and um, you know it, it really extends my offer of coaching into into the public space and and really just puts things out there um, how to help artists advance their practices, how to develop their practices, what are best professional practices, what are international trends, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lack of knowledge around these, these issues. Um, many artists are working at a regional or local level. Um, and certainly the, the sort of ecologies of local, regional and international are very mixed. Um, but sometimes there, there is, and I'm going to pop a light on here, um, just a little, there's quite a, quite a lot of ignorance about how these different spheres operate, um, how they interrelate, and, and how to advance your practice, um, how to move from a regional to a national or from a national to an international level. Um, and, and that's really some of the issues, some of the key issues that I'd like to address. And I, I encourage you all to listen very hard to Hei Young's presentation and take notes and have questions ready for her um, for q and I'd like us to, the, the discussion or the, the whole podcast is one hour. Um, we can run over a little bit, but I'd like to try and keep it to that. So Hei Young, if you could present for no more than 30 minutes and then we can really open it up to discussions, questions and answers and um, and so that you, the audience, can can take this opportunity to, to ask Hei Yong um, any questions you may have about um, developing your, your practice and um, how to approach curators, how to, what you should be applying for, things like that and um, I think this is also a very timely discussion because so many uh, galleries, biennales, exhibitions, um, outlets, fairs are, are closed or closing permanently. And I think the landscape is changing in a radical and um, long-term way. And, and we're going to see this knock-on effect. And uh, you know, it's, it's something we need to negotiate um, in real time, and, and it would be very interesting to hear Heyong's perspective on the post-COVID international ceramic scene. Um, so Heyong, I'm going to start sharing the screen and hand over to you, if, if that's okay. Sure, sure. I'll also just ask everybody to mute their, their, themselves so that we don't have any background noise. Um, and um just say that that I've asked Heyong to radically reduce her presentation, um, which originally was much more extensive and included a history of Korean craft and perhaps at a later stage, um, if there's interest, perhaps you can put your name in the box, in the chat box, if you're interested in an additional session with Hei Young on the history of uh, Korean ceramics, um, looking into modern and perhaps even touching a little bit on contemporary, although she will touch on contemporary today, um, and as well as Korean crafts. Uh, pop your name in and we can organize that for a later later date. But as I said today, we're really looking at, at professional practice. So, um, uh, sorry, view. Um, I know, is that it? No, sorry, I, I've. I've um, I can't remember how to do it. I just hit a blank. Um, um, go to slideshow. Okay, sorry, slideshow. There we go. And yeah, and then. Oh, no, no, no. So the presentation. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I don't see it from. From current side, is that the automated one? No. Heyang, is that the right one? Uh, current, no, slideshow. Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. That's it. Super. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, over to you, Henry. Can I operate? Can I operate it? Um, uh, I can't turn the page. Okay, I'll I'll do it for you. Just um as we go. Okay. All right, yes. So thank you very much, Wendy, for giving me this opportunity. It's a great pleasure. And I think what you're doing is wonderful. And today the focus is very much on looking at works that have become very renowned around the world and the reason why it has become globally noticed. And as curators, both Wendy and I, I would like to share her ideas on looking at pieces and also the prices and why they are what they are. And also I'm going to share a little bit about my background in curating and why I was able to do those pieces, uh, those uh, exhibitions. Uh, basically, currently I have my own consulting company and I'm consulting a lot of government organizations in Korea currently in uh, fundraising and operating exhibitions. And I've recently become the Korean representative for the International Academy of Ceramics. And uh, I have been working actively as panel expert, uh, as well as uh, promoting Korean and Asian crafts to the Loewe Craft Prize. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm selecting artists and then introducing them to the Loewe Craft Prize before they actually uh, apply to the Craft Prize. So, Wendy? Mm -hmm. Yes, the main thing in our uh, practice is the practice of constancy and change, uh, which is very important, particularly if you're doing ceramics. We have still a very Confucian-based society where we have to respect our ancestral roots. And uh, anyone doing ceramics, it's a great burden because we have to keep the lineage and we have to do well. It's a great responsibility. And uh, for anyone learning ceramics, we have to learn the basics in Celadon, Ongi, uh, earthenware, um, porcelain, as well as Puncheon. So um, without those skills, we cannot go forward. And uh, so it's a way of saying that we keep the old and find new ways of expressing. Uh, everyone knows probably In Jin Lee. He has become somewhat a uh, icon in Korean ceramics because uh, he really practices the Choson uh, way of working. During the Choson period, the potters just work from five o'clock in the morning until sunset. Uh, and uh, he really practices in that way. So he begins his day by throwing on the wheel. He, I don't know how many pots he throws in a day. And then uh, he goes off to teach at Hongik University which is one of the best um, ceramics curriculum in the country. And his pieces are in almost all museums around the world, including the Metropolitan, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Lacoma, and also uh, Chicago, and also in the UK at the Victorian Albert and the British Museum. So it's just uh, saying that the roots of our culture is something that really attracts many of the collectors and also the museums. And um, you can see that this is a beautiful piece. This a piece is actually in the collection of the Chicago Art Institute. And it's one of their favorites, as so I have been told. Uh, as for Umbam Lee, uh, he is a rare maker because celadon is really not easy to make. And he's using the celadon to reinterpret it in a very contemporary style. And the reason why it's difficult to make celadon is actually the firing. The reduction condition has to be apt to get the green. And as you see on the piece, uh, there are inlaid lines and he's depicting the lotus flower. So working in Celadon is a very rare kind of 
uh, practice, but it is continued. And in the next slide, you can also see another celadon maker, but he, this uh, maker is actually quite funky. So he's using Coca-Cola and different PET bottles to cast off the shape and then decorated using the traditional patterns. And his work has also been collected widely because of the fun uh, aspect of uh, the pieces. And I've actually included uh, this piece uh, in the book that was published by the Samuel P. Hahn Museum, University of Florida with Jason Stuber. Next one. And this is uh, a piece depicting the Goryeo period uh, incense burner. And it's, if you look at it, it's completely nothing to do with the old piece. It's all snails. The old piece is more about rabbits, uh, lotus flower and dragons and so on. But this piece is all like snails and different uh, motifs, but still it keeps the uh, traditional element. This is something that is becoming more and, pop more and more popular in our ceramic scene in Korea. And that is the use of the computer designing through the CAMCAD and then producing it using 3D production. And Sangdok is one of the leading figures in doing this. And he's producing uh, Celadon by using uh, different computer-based uh, datas on the shape uh, these are tiles that he uses for architectural projects, and um, he, he's very good uh, in processing 3D-wise. And we cannot uh, go without mentioning this person. Shin sang -ho is a very important figure in Korean contemporary ceramics because he's actually the founder of the what we call the uh, Ceramics Exposition, which was founded in 2001. And uh, he, he is a master at raising funds, uh, establishing projects. And he also founded the Kimei Clay Arc Museum down south, where the residency is becoming very popular. The maker started off as a Puncheong artist and moved on to do more sculptural pieces. Now, the core of our contemporary ceramics also has much influence from American contemporary ceramics because in the 1970s, most of the people who went to study abroad were given funds by the Korean government uh, who were working in collaboration with the American government. And so it was really free to travel to America and study because of the grant issues. So many of the influences that was practiced in the 1980s and 1990s in contemporary Korean ceramics has heavy influence on American contemporary ceramics. You would be surprised to know. This is something we can also talk about later, but it's true. And uh, Shin sang -ho was also very heavily influenced by June Kaniko. Uh, next slide is also a Puncheong piece. He's probably a world star, I would say, in the ceramic world. He's done uh, some of these demonstrations at the British Biennale in 2017 and also uh, for making futures and elsewhere. I think he did a tour in the uni United States um, uh, universities between 2001 and 2004 uh, with Oh Hyang Jong, who is another Ongi maker. Okay. And uh, following Yi Gang Hyo, this is another star who is uprising. Uh, practicing in the Puncheong, as I explained at the beginning, these are one of the features that cannot be denied in our ceramic world. And Puncheong is a very effective way of decorating the surface, as it's basically using the white slip to powder the surface of the clay body. And it was done originally to uh, cover 
the uh, bad quality of clay in the historical times, but today is used more as a kind of an abstract expression. As for Sekyun Chu, when he also worked with this artist, uh, what is interesting is that he never studied ceramics. He was originally a sculpture major, but found it very difficult to uh, kind of uh, express his own values through like three-dimensional sculptural work. So he wanted to be sincere to the material. So he came to the ceramics department and started to work with clay and fell in love with working in clay. And what he does is he draws with pencil on the surfaces of these pieces. And they are historical pieces. The dimension is same as the historical pieces. And instead of using uh, clay ingredients or uh, uh, ceramics ingredients, he uses pencil to draw on the surface and uh, polishes with a varnish at the end. The moon jar is a constant subject that occurs. And uh, although I put Su Zhong Li, the master of moon jar is actually Kwon De Sop, and he sold to a Belgian collector by the name of Axel for uh, 80,000 US dollars. Uh, and since then, the Munja has become a collectible item among many Europeans and American collectors. And um, for me, I'm not so keen on the Munja, but it's a combination of two large bowls assembled together in the middle. And what I like about this piece is that the maker does not hide the fact that it's connected in the middle. And it really shows where the connection is. And uh, this is where usually the dent is created in a normal moon jar. Yes, and uh, Kuang Su Se is actually a master. Uh, another aspect that is interesting in Korean ceramics is that they don't like to mix the masters uh, with the academia. So people educated in universities, but I have been at the forefront of doing this because they have as much experience or more than the people who have been educated in universities. Uh, because in the 1970s, the universities professors would go to these masters to learn the skills because they didn't have the skills. So it's a bit of an irony, but uh, Kwang Su Se has been doing really well and probably one of the best Munja makers in keeping the line that is so um, similar to the Choson period um, Munjas. So it's very, very, very similar to the original Munjas. And I think the reason why the moon jars are so attracted to the collectors is because of its kind of calm, serene, and kind of a dynamic presence when you put it in an interior space. Originally, it was used for storing wine, uh, rice wine, and different kind of liquids also used as a vase. Sun Yi Li is also internationally known artist, uh, working mostly in China because of the flat, flat tiles. If we cannot get it in Korea, uh, of, in Jindajang, as many people know, working in ceramics, almost anything is possible. And so it was very difficult to get a porcelain tile that is about, this is about uh, almost two meters long. Uh, which would not warp in the kiln. So um, he has worked consistently in trying to overcome these problems. And the actual motif is based on the Choson Dynasty porcelains that you find in museums. Yes, and this is a very interesting piece because it's based on the blue and white, but using the kind of the marbling technique where the uh, pigment is implied into the clay body, uh, but uh, it's a beautiful piece, functional, a highly collectible piece and well-known around the world too, presented by uh, Gallery LVS, as he has been working with them for a long time. 
and it requires a lot of skills uh, because um, of the faceting as well as getting the shape so perfect. And Han Zhang Li uh, is amazing because he is uh, so experimental in using different materials outside of ceramics. This particular piece is uh, covered with lacquer. And you can see the different sheens. The bottom is has more glo gloss, while the top is a matte effect. And then it's uh, designed with mother of pearl using the crane uh, motif. And um, every time this artist has an exhibition, is almost always sold out. Yes, and Jerry Kim, uh, kind of uh, Phoebe Cummings of Korea, I would say, um, also has worked with uh, Wendy uh, for the Taiwan Biennale. And uh, she's also actually a sculpture major. But what is interesting is that when these sculpture majors use clay, they do wonders because they go beyond the idea of the technique. So they have no uh, kind of um, preconceived notion in uh, how to do certain things. So they become very conceptual and experiment with a lot of different ideas. And this is a really interesting piece because in Korea, most of the 1970s buildings are being put down to uh, replace the area with high-raised apartments. And she's really talking about that. And the architectural feature of this building is actually what you would find in Korea, uh, built in the 1970s, 1980s. And uh, they're rather ugly looking buildings, but um, she's done a good job. And what she does is once she makes every single piece, she assembles them together and then uh, has a uh, kind of a, uh, a plate with water and once you put the piece it slowly sinks and disappears so she's referring to the aspect of uh, of uh, knocking down buildings in Korea to replace uh, high-raised apartments and this kind of piece is really difficult to collect because um, you have to stop the water take the piece out and then keep it some somewhere else uh otherwise the hook the piece the complete the piece completely uh, disappears underwater uh, so what she has started to do is hire a professional photographer and uh, she uh, captures the different stages of the piece being um, completely disappearing so, I never dreamt of becoming a curator. I always wanted to be an artist and I worked at a chocolate factory, I think it's N5 uh, in the early 1990s. And I really loved uh, doing clay work. My idol was Magdalene Odundo because I loved coiling. And so when I came to Korea at the age of 25, unlike other people, uh, at the time people were going abroad to study, I came to Korea to study because I really didn't know much about my own culture. I left Korea when I was four years old and I lived in Hong Kong, Kuwait, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia. I was sent to boarding school in the UK and um, I uh, did my BA as a ceramic maker in Bristol in the heydays under Walter Keeler, Mo Job, and really fascinating teachers at the time. So I was really excited to become an artist. But um, when I came to Korea, it was really difficult to work because in Korea, if you don't have the academia connected, it's very difficult to find a studio to slot yourself into. So I decided to go right to school. And next slide, please, Wendy. And uh, that is where I began to learn how to curate exhibitions because the project from the fire uh, was given to our university. And my professor at the time said, would you like to help me in curating this exhibition? And it's one of the largest projects ever for Korean ceramics to be exposed to the world. And thanks to this exhibition, which happened from 
2002 in terms of preparation and was actually exposed to the world in 2004 at the Crow Collection of Asian Art Dallas. Uh, I didn't even know about this museum at the time, but I found out that it was very highly recognized for promoting Asian art. And we were very lucky. Uh, at the time, we were working with a nonprofit organization called International Arts and Artists, and they were the ones who approached the project together with the Crow Collection, who funded the majority of the exhibition together with the Carpenter Foundation. And so the exhibition traveled to 13 different venues for uh to from 2004 to 2009 and this is where i learned all my curatorial work from doing the inventory transportation checking the works and then going to actually all 13 places to see all the works were arrived safely and then each space had a different atmosphere because the museum designers all had different ideas of showing the work. And that was the most uh, exciting part of the exhibition. So this is the Crow Collection. This is how we started off uh, tape cutted the exhibition. And you see this man on your right side is Mr. Crow, a real estate uh, mega rich person who funded uh, the exhibition. And this is at the uh, Pacific Asia Museum in Pasadena, uh, LA, California. Uh, this is in, I think this was in Minnesota. This is in uh, Chicago, uh, no, San Francisco. And so because the exhibition was so successful, uh, the International Arts and Artists asked me to do another one with them. And uh, we did another one touring uh, Europe this time. But th it was more difficult because raising the fund was not so easy. The good thing about working with America is that every museum has, the, has a mandatory uh, aspect where they have to contribute at least about 10,000 US dollars at the time. And so that money was given to the exhibition for artists to travel to do workshops and talks and so on. So we had very good amount of money to actually work on the exhibition. But for this exhibition, I had to raise on my own. So I contacted the Korea Foundation, which is under the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, and they gave us something like 50,000 US dollars. And so we were able to work, work on this exhibition, as well as uh, the galleries in uh, Northern Ireland. So we were very surprised to be contacted by Northern Ireland. They were very interested. The difference between the first exhibition and this exhibition is that for this exhibition, we had 30 artists. The first exhibition had 58 artists. And this time we fo focused more on the kind of uh, formative expressions rather than vessels and more kind of functional pieces. And it actually traveled to the Victorian Album Museum in 2011. So this is the first uh, showing of the exhibition uh, at the Omiobath Gallery, which was a wonderful gallery, but it's closed down today. Yes, so um, after having done curatorial work for almost, I think that's like uh, almost eight years uh, between 2004 and 2011, uh, I began to do small exhibitions on my own. Then in 2013, I was lucky to work as the international commissioner. And so I overlooked the invitation of international artists as well as organized the symposium. At the time, I worked with Magdalene Odundo uh, with the Alfred uh, Alfred University and also with the 21st universe, uh, 21st Century Museum in Kanazawa, Japan. So we had speakers coming from 
uh, all the, these different areas, as well as uh, Bristol uh, with my very good friend, Matthew Partington. And then uh, this led me to do the Chongju International Craft Biennale. And uh, ironically, I was the first uh, art director to come a craft background, although this is a craft biennale. Uh, previously, they were either designers or contemporary, coming from contemporary art worlds. So I was really proud to be the first craft based uh, art director. So I did as much as I could, including uh, everything that I could put into this exhibition that was craft related. And so what else can I start with but the tools? So I began with the tools and the different materials uh, required for making wood, woodwork, uh, glass, uh, textiles, and so on. So the first Hall had all the tools you can think of from uh, book printing to glass making. And I also included the 3D aspect. So this is a traditional Korean hat made uh, through the 3D printing process. And I worked with a London based hat maker at the time. And then this led on to uh, a small but private exhibition, one that is very noted around the world, uh, the Bernardo Foundation, to celebrate 130 years Korea-France relationship. So uh, this exhibition really gave me a global exposure. And after that, I was asked to do some writings and also do some jury and um, a lot of uh, consulting work after this exhibition. And this is um, some cuts of it. Um, uh, and what's exciting about the uh, Bernardo exhibition is that they use their old pro pro uh, production uh, factory as an exhibition space. So this, uh, these are the kiln, kiln, rolling kilns, and they work as the plinth for the uh, works. And so it was very difficult exhibition because the space is very difficult, but uh, a very interesting uh, challenge it was. So basically my focus in curating is how to present works that can be understood both by the uh, audience that are outside of Korea and also uh, by keeping the Korean uh, essential aesthetics. And then I did all major shows in Korea with Craft Trend Fair. We'll quickly go through this, sorry, Wendy. Sorry, 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 yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. yeah, and then Milan Design Week. These are the staff I worked with, which we went to London Craft Week after Milan. And this was a exhibition on food at the Folk Museum in Korea. They wanted to do summer food exhibition, and so it was very interesting. And then um, this uh, uh, treasure contemporary craft was a fair which began, and they wanted to have a lot of Korean galleries get involved in it because of the collectors in Europe. But sadly, because it was privately funded, it was only a one-off fair. Uh, and they spent a large amount of money in the first uh, showing. And uh, Loewe has been very exciting to work with because they have their own focus. It's about innovation, heritage, uh, new skills, as well as having individual aesthetics. So the uh, focus is on that. And I know uh, people who are watching today have also applied to Louis Craft Prize. Uh, but what I can tell you is that 
don't be uh, uh, put off by not being selected the first round because uh, once I got into working with them, I saw that some people have applied for like several times and then actually got to the final stages. But what is exciting about the Low Wave Craft Prize is that um, I'm always worried when I work with big brands because they can manipulate their name and then not serve the craft makers uh, in a proper way. But what they do is they do a wonderful job in uh, exposing each artist. And because of the pandemic, they're now filming the studios of the finalists and showing uh, the pieces, the studios through their website. And so, you know, they're working really hard to remain sincere to the making aspect of craft and to the artists. So I think Loewe has uh, since 2017, when it was first uh, established, has put a lot of interest in the crafts. So in that respect, it's very important. Okay. So that really ends my uh, uh, slideshow, but uh, the focal point of my curatorial aspect is I remain true to the material, then I look at uh, whether the artist can be um, global material, because I'm working internationally, uh, meaning that whether a lot of people would find it interesting to collect the work, and then how they have used the clay to express it in a new way that was not used before, but still keeping, retaining the Korean traditional methods. And I'm also looking at uh, innovative and new skills because I think the trend of the time is very important and we need to reflect it on to what we do and whatever field we work in. And uh, the pandemic, although we are all going through a very difficult time, is a really good period for resourcing and archiving our materials and I think I believe it's a great time to promote yourself through the internet and also different platforms like Wendy is doing today and the best bit about uh, the uh, pandemic is that we can travel the world without going on the plane for a few for many hours I mean going to Chicago is like 14 hours or so, but it really saves time and we can do a lot of discussions, which I have been doing over the last three months uh, nonstop. And it's really been exciting. And I think what one, Wendy is doing is wonderful because we can share ideas in craft, which is so, uh, so much needed in this field. Uh, it's not been discussed so much uh, as we are doing today. And I think it's a great time, a very exciting time. Thank you very much, Hei Young. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and I totally agree. I think it's a very terrifying time, but it's also a super exciting time with, with access to so many yes. people that we never had access to on Zoom. I mean, I do think we're all a little bit Zoomed out, um, <laughs> but 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 they are that I think just keeping positive and um, keeping growing and and nourishing our practices even if we can't get to our studios is is it is a phenomenal time to to nurture your practice intellectually um, and put in place. Uh, thoughts for taking your work forward um, post. COVID and, and making plans post-COVID. Yeah, and uh, the selections that I made uh, are quite pricey. And I want Wendy to comment on this. Uh, and I'm always um, in conflict with the makers in Korea because uh, besides people like uh, In Jin Lee and Kang Yo Lee, um, not most of them are well known around the world, but their price is like um, anywhere between 10,000 to 5,000 US dollars, which is very expensive. And these are, some of them are young artists 
uh, and uh, they have a long way to go. And in Korea, the pricing is done uh, in comparison to painting um, because they consider themselves as one of makers. Uh, they say like one piece is like a canvas and they uh, work out how many hours they put into it and then the material costs. So I don't know. Um, I believe there is a standard way of doing this and uh, Artsy uh, and Artnet, they have been very useful in this way because once you upload your information onto Artsy or Artnet, you are exposing yourself to the world. So you have to keep the price. Uh, it's about uh, your own responsibility in uh, how to sell your work. So I have asked many of the artists to work together in this way and to work with galleries, but because our galleries in Korea do not have so many collectors that they can guarantee the living of the artists, uh, many artists are working with several galleries instead of just one gallery. And this is a huge problem. And so many of the makers are looking outside of Korea to be represented by uh, international galleries. And one of the most successful stories is the glassmaker Jun Young Kim, who is represented by Adrian Sassoon. I'm not saying that Adrian is the best of the galleries or dealers, but it's, it's kind of a... a, a He's blue chip. He's a blue chip. Yeah, blue chip. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. So this is one of the major problems in our country. Yeah. Even Singapore or Thailand, uh, because I had an opportunity to work with them last year, they have good galleries and they represent and they uh, are able to promote uh, with substantial amount of collectors, uh, one uh, artist or so. But um, this is a major problem in Korea. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to open it up to questions for, for Hei Young about um, perhaps gallery representation, pricing, uh, any, any issues. Do you want to just raise your hand and, and unmute yourself and please, please go for it? Okay, everybody's overwhelmed. <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> Okay, Alison, no, Mar Martelise, hi, nice, lovely to have you. Did you Hello. have a question? Yeah, you got to, oh, we can't hear you, Martelise. Yeah, type your question. Okay, Alison, do you have a question? You'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, can't hear Alison. No. Yes, Caroline. Caroline. I can, um, I'm trying with this technology. Uh, <laughs> I just <laughs> wondered, uh, hey Young, what you felt, yeah. you talk about, your last comment was about um, the gallery space and the importance of a good dealer. Um, I'm just wondering whether now with the pandemic and um, whether you find that maybe there's new ideas around how people might, um, uh, ceramicists or artists will um, use the internet instead of perhaps going down the more traditional gallery representation. That's a really good question. And uh, it's a question that I've been posed by many Korean artists today. Um, I know in the UK, the uh, selling of craft pieces is all about the experience. So you need the champagne, you need the space, you need the collectors to experience and you need the artists to talk about the work. Um, so it's, it's a really difficult time for selling work because I'm not a dealer, but I do also um, work as a middle person in introducing artists to galleries and also enabling them to be promoted by different galleries for sales. Um, showing it through the internet is just not the same. This I, I have no substitute for, uh, but the studio visits have been really effective 
What I'm saying is we have to sell the whole experience rather than just the object itself. So what I've been doing is filming studio uh, visits, going to studios, showing the entire process of the work and then how the pieces are made, the processes. And so the collectors are led to see a new world which they find very interesting. For us as curators or dealers, is a lot more work because we have to actually go and film it. And the filming is very costly. It's how you do it, how much uh, technology you have. Uh, and I think it's the same for the artists. Uh, we were talking about it yesterday also, is how to show the work in a three-dimensional way. So you have to have better um, uh, computer skills, um, equipment, and so on. But I believe in being very sincere and true to the value of the material. So basically I'm not that well off when it comes to equipment. So I use my iPhone and I think the iPhone has been quite wonderful. I just attach a speaker onto it and a light device uh, and it works really well. So um, showing the studio, showing the story. So basically what we need is storytelling at this period in order to uh, the work to speak for itself. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. The image itself is not enough. Yeah. I think um, what we've seen with the Lova videos and we've been seeing with Joanna Bird over a while is very sophisticated um, personalities coming through um, and uh, sort of, yeah, very intimate, very intimate relations where you go into people's studios and um, in the, the video with, for example, Bodil Mance produced by Lova, yeah. you see the work her grandchildren produced. And it's so you sort of get a very privileged sense of like, oh my God, this is not like a can studio visit where it's all it's all ready for us. And and it's um it was sort of quite intimate and off the cuff and and we saw private stuff. And and I think that that storytelling really does draw one in and and in the absence of champagne, it's it's perhaps even better than champagne because we've been doing champagne for quite a while. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn? Yeah, I, I have a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think about online exhibitions at museums? I'm not talking about galleries versus a catalog. There's so much more work put into bringing pieces in, filming them. I think Loy had a, the... Um, the video, which uh, is probably profes professionally done much better than we could do. Right. And the, the longevity of having a catalog afterwards, uh, as opposed to uh, an online exhibition. I totally agree with that. I think an online catalog is great. And um, my recent project has been with two photographers. And again, uh, we spent a lot of money on it. We spent, the total funding was 35,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are going to put it up on Google Arts and Culture, which is a great platform to use for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, the only thing about the online catalogs is that, um, I don't know if people really concentrate on it. That's one aspect. But um, because if you make it into a very long version, you know, people get very tired of turning the pages. And so you have to think a lot about the visual qualities, about how to present it uh, in a way that will make them focus. Mm -hmm. Would you include the uh, artist statements? In, in, in there? I think a shorter artist yes. statement, so people yes. I would short, take Shorter to... artist statements, uh, the core of their philosophy, uh, so maybe one or two lines about what their concept is, uh, and but the work is the most important. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I want to jump in there and just say, in France, mm -hmm. I work with an amazing digital art book producer, which produced artist books it's artist books. So they were very uh, uh, creative in, in including film, including slideshows, including sound, including um, 
elements and just designing these digital experiences in very innovative ways. And I don't see any, or I see very few ceramic artists being adventurous and and trying to produce digital digital catalogs that are anything beyond sort of an artist statement and an image and yeah. maybe a few lines about the project and I'm guilty of this myself um, simply because it requires a lot of time and time equals money and and well the project some of the projects that I've been involved in recently have been pro bono for example um, but but yeah I think that that there is a space for exploitation of new new media in quite simple ways to produce very innovative catalogs that isn't being taken. Um, I think it's a really good question, but uh, online exhibitions, um, I'm not so keen because traveling into the virtual space and it's just not the same, but it's, it's, it's another kind of experience, which, um, I actually found it quite interesting, but it also requires a lot of computer skills and uh, Korea is very advanced in these skills. So the, our National Museum of Korea has spent millions on doing this uh, this year. And if you actually go into the website, you can see what wonderful job they've done. It's like actually being there. So, you know, you can all visit, it's free of charge. And so have a look. Uh, but unless it's that kind of quality, uh, online exhibitions have to be very difficult. And referring back to the catalog, in Korea, we're also now trying to develop mobile-based PDF catalogs, so where people can just flip through like this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But, so but what you're saying are... is, is that gets quite boring after a while, and including sound and including video and including yes. power, PowerPoints. Yes. In yes. a video, in a in a digital catalog, make it yeah. so much more interesting, because the the I think we all are as makers love materials and books are are so wonderful to a beautiful book. There's nothing nicer than than you know paging yeah. your paper yeah. and feeling that that sensory aspect, which is lost once again. You know when when you're just doing a digital thing. So so yeah. one of the ways of making you halt is is that kind of more integrated aspect. I'm going to go quickly to Marta Lisa's question, um, which is thank you for this conversation um, to, to you and I. Would you agree that an artist pricing grows with an exponential statistic? In other words, start low and grow, or should one rather start higher and keep it at a level constant? Um, that's a very good question. And it's about recognition in the field, I think. Uh, so uh, it really depends on how much you start off with, right? And I would give it a good space for it to grow as the years go by, because you're gonna build a body of work. And so, yes, uh, as a starting off artist, I wouldn't say start off too low, but as a, a reasonable price. And uh, I think we need to really study uh, how different people from really recognized people to starting off artists are pricing their work internationally as well as domestically. And then we have to come up with a price that is reasonable for the collectors to be able to spend. And in Korea, I think uh, starting off anywhere between 1,000 to 5,000 is the starting point. And then it goes up like skyrocket. Yeah. I don't know what you think, Wendy. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Mm. Um, I'm always, I'm always kind of, um, uh, tortured when I see those sometimes galleries se selling works that are very very labor intensive for very low prices of young artists yeah. and yeah. I, I think it's very hard it's a very difficult space because mm -hmm. some artists make work that that is really quick to make and some artists will spend hundreds of hours um, on a standard production piece and yet they are 
selling for similar prices. And, and this is where I think, you know, those kind of storytelling and narratives are essential to make uh, collectors and the market aware of one, the level of craft and two, the degree of labor involved in certain um, artworks that, that when a young maker perhaps wants to ask 5,000 or 10,000 for a piece, it's because they've invested um, a month or more full time making that, that work. Um, and it's not because they're being pretentious. Having said that, I do acknowledge that there's a huge risk to make those kind of works and, and people who, who, who do that do so knowingly that um, they, they need a second job as a waitress or, or something else to, to bring in the money because it's very difficult to get started um, and um, grow, grow, grow collectors. Singing has a question. Singing? Hi, good morning. Hi. Morning. Um, six o'clock in the morning in uh, New York. Thank, thank you, Singing. <laughs> thank you, Singing. Oh, very, very nice to see you guys. And uh, oh. I have a question, Hei Yong. Yeah. Did you come across about the pricing? Because usually gallery is in the United States, they take like 50 50, you know, depends on which gallery you deal with. Mm -hmm. Do you come across with situation is in, in another country that when you come across with pricing and uh, they ask you for the bottom price and then um, the gallery or the dealer will be mark their own price. So in a way, like an uh, artist give the bottom price and then the gallery will put it in according to the context on the connection. And then they will price the work in the, sometimes it's, 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 it is incredibly high. Sometimes it is just a little higher than the, uh, re, than the artist price. So how do you deal with the kind of fluctuations? Well, uh, America I know is 50-50. In Korea it's 60-40. So the 60 goes to the artist and 40 goes to the gallery. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, some galleries, they don't tell you how much they add on to it, uh, but whatever the bottom price they give to the artist is 60% uh, of what they sell. So yes, uh, of course the price is gonna rise when you work with a gallery. This is just natural. Um, it's, it's a very good question and it's something that we're still working on in the field. Uh, because you know, as soon as uh, we add the extra 40% in the original price, uh, then it goes up. But I think the artist should not give the bottom price because then it becomes too low. So how to keep the margin between a reasonable price is the question. And you have to really work closely with the galleries to agree upon this, but dealers like Adrian Sassoon will not tell you how much they are going to add on to the piece and so on. So uh, it, it's a place where the artist can be manipulated and uh, used. So you have to be very careful when you sign the contract to agree upon a price. But the good thing about um, I would say like good galleries is that they do have a secured, and I've seen this in the United States, a secured uh, body of collectors where they consistently come to new shows to see new works and then buy the pieces. So I think that's the best way to work. If you can have a consistent body of collectors, that is the main thing to aim for. And in order to do that, uh, even as artists, you have to spend time having dinner or going to afternoon lunch and you know doing these social uh, things so uh, it's it's really difficult as an artist to make your own work then to promote and then work with the galleries but it's it's the reality um i'm going to jump on the uh, sorry mm. yeah 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 i'm i'm particularly what more kind of a book uh the question is more geared to it since you are dealing with internationally because mm -hmm. the other country have a different kind of rules 
yes. and then our yes. own practice. And then I'm just kind of curious about um, not just, uh, you know, in one country, but how you deal with internationally. When, when we go international, if you have two dealers, one in Korea and one in, let's say, UK, then you have to always inform both galleries of what you're doing, what exhibitions you're doing and uh, what uh, fairs you're going to. It's very important to keep your reputation by allowing both galleries to know your status. And then what happens is if one gallery uh, sells, the work, then uh, in Korea, we say we have to give 10% to the other gallery that is representing you. This is a kind of a understood uh, mechanism that works in the art field. So anybody, even curator, if you introduce someone, you should also, in reality, be paid 10%. Uh, so it's very uh, important that you keep the network between the galleries. And then we also have to think about the different taxes in different uh, countries. So that is done by the galleries where they, some countries take 20%, some galleries take 24% off as taxes. So we also include that in the prices. Yeah, I think um, what, what many artists also don't realize um, in terms of galleries and representation, well, there, there's two things. I think one is when there are very few blue chip galleries left, and I think there's going to be even fewer left after COVID. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of the smaller galleries disappearing and, some, and, and also a lot of the middle tier galleries have been gobbled up by bigger galleries. Um, and, and that landscape is changing. And I think we're seeing interesting formations of s sort of the smaller um, emerging new galleries that are setting up collaborative projects. And, and I think that's quite interesting um, and something worth looking out for as a younger maker is, is trying to get, um, or, or even trying to establish yourself um, sort of a, a network of emerging makers, curators um, to, to create um, sort of collaborative exhibitions because then you're not just bringing in one set of collectors, you're bringing in multiple audiences and collectors. Um, the second thing is, I think there's also quite a lot of unknown around how, what galleries do and the bigger blue chip galleries. For example, if you take your work if they take your work to Miami Basel, that's you paying up to twenty thousand US dollars per square meter, and those play those shows have got 10, 15 square meters. You can't do anything in under nine. So add that up and just think of their overheads. They've got that rent. They've got all the champagne. They've got all the invitations. They've got um, <laughs> taking transporting the work there. They've suddenly got like a million bucks invested in, a, you know, in a Miami Basel before they arrive. And and of course they're going to want their share of your work, and they're going to want um, your share the share of your collectors um, and they're going to want if, if they will allow you on their stand you better be dressed and ready and super slick and play the game very well and that makes people very uncomfortable it makes people and and i mean i i i, I and i know a lot of artists who've sort of been there done that got the ticket and ran very fast because they were very uncomfortable with with those dynamics but that is i mean those that is the reality of blue chip galleries and it's not a very pretty or comfortable place to be for most artists who, who value authenticity, value being themselves um, and don't want to scrub up and be um, slick salespeople on, on <laughs> these sort of sanitized stands, essentially. As a curator, I think exhibitions are very important. And I think in the future, they may become more important because the art fairs are no longer so effective mm. uh, because, uh, I mean, like Collect next year is also going online. Uh, so is Schmuck in Germany. So many of these fairs are all going online and uh, as well as Art Basel, which is one of the leading fine art um, 
events. Uh, and I heard that the sales have been not good. Um, again, it's all dealing with aesthetics. So how do you uh, transmit the aesthetics through the internet, you know, no matter how good the computer skills are. So we are facing, you know, different challenges today. And so we have to find new leeways to uh, help uh, makers to promote their work. And as a curator, I enjoy most in putting uh, artist works in museum collections. This is my most, you know, satisfying achievement. So through the From the Fire exhibition, it was really fulfilling because having shown it for a long time, more people became interested and more people asked about collecting the pieces. I'm not a dealer, as I mentioned, so I just connect the people together and then it just happens naturally. And the curator in the museums do the jobs uh, with their own uh, collect, uh, with their own donors and board of trustees, directors and whatever. And so they come, they see the work and they collect the pieces. And it was a great experience in that way. So if we can work around the exhibitions in such a way, I think that's the best way to keep the value of the artists and the value of the work. Okay, a question from Linda, who's also up very early in uh, uh, Montreal, I think. Hey, Linda, um, how would you advise artists to approach curators and keep them appraised of new work? How do you do it, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> Linda, you get at this. Come on, how, what do you do? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm just especially thinking of uh, emerging artists or young artists. I'm a teacher. Uh -huh. And um, would you suggest that they, um, I, of course, many young artists have social media uh, outlets. Um, is there a way that um, they can bring their work to your attention more than others? I, what, what's, what are some of the protocols? I just thought since we had both of you, it might be a good chance to ask. Hey, well. Um, I try to invite curators to every exhibition that I do. I'm rather a uh, feisty kind of, you know, uh, when I grab someone, I, I won't let them go. Uh, so over the years, working with Bernardo exhibition, I invited curators from the British Museum and also the Victoria Albert Museum, as well as Philadelphia and Metropolitan Museum. I was very lucky. Uh, and what I did was I made sure that there is something special in the invitation. So I hand wrote uh, or mm -hmm. the invitation. So I try to make an effort uh, in doing things that people don't do today. I am a very 1970s girl, uh, hippie in my heart. Uh, and I like to, I prefer uh, writing letters more than uh, texting messages. And so um, the curator wrote back to me through email and said, I was moved by your handwritten invitation, I'm coming. And so they came to the exhibition. And so we were able to take that exhibition to the Victoria Albert Museum. And we were able to sell some pieces to the museum also, and also to their donors and collectors. So I think in everything you do, you have to do something outside of the boundary. And uh, once I make the connection, I keep the connection very close. And I keep reminding that I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And uh, uh, I also make appointments when I go to the UK to make an effort to meet the curators. Uh, uh, in America also, uh, and I'm very lucky because I do have some very good curator friends. And so basically I just build on that and it keeps growing, you know, and I make sure at the end of the year, I write letters, I write, you know, Christmas cards and, and so on. And uh, they're also looking always for new artists for their collections because you know they run out of resources and this is a good thing. And so we can give them help by uh, giving them feedback on this. 
So that's the process that I've been working. And so any articles that I write or any uh, thing that I do, I keep persisting in reminding them that I'm doing this and that, and you know, sending materials and books, books on Korea, books on uh, Korean ceramics and so on. Yeah. So you just have to, you just have to, um, I, I don't have much inhibition. So anyone who I want to meet, I would phone them up tomorrow and uh, just uh, start talking right to them. And then once I build that platform, I make sure that I remain very uh, true to them, you know, since I try to uh, keep the trust and build on that relationship. And Japan is one of the countries that's not easy to work with uh, because it takes a long time to build that trust. And uh, I have been very fortunate since 2016 because I built a very, very good relationship with the director of the museum, Yuji Akimoto of the 21st Century Museum. And since then we have been working on many projects in terms of writing and critiquing uh, university students and so I have almost now a 10 year relationship. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's based on trust and uh, integrity, yeah. Yeah, um, from my side, I think I'm, I'm perhaps less institutional than Hei Young um, in terms of my activities um, and perhaps a little bit more eclectic and I do a lot of research and I'm constantly curious about new subjects. And one of the places I post my queries is on Critical Craft Forum on Facebook. Yeah. And um, I, people respond to me and, and I take them really seriously and I will follow all those conversations as much as I can and ask artists to send me dossiers and ask them to send me catalogs and ask them, and and build relationships. Often my relationships with artists are around a specific research query, and that's how it comes. They come to my attention. I do. I and I always tell everybody. You know, I I used to. I, I, I used to be very active on Facebook. I'm not. I'm kind of active on Instagram, but I spend a. I've got endless lists, and I've got huge Excel spreadsheets of artists with keywords that I'm interested of themes and things that I'm interested in. So um, just for example, um, green ceramics, I'll have um, body as vessel, vessel as body, um, th new technologies in ceramics or whatever, whatever the themes are. I have like endless themes that interest me and, and a, a post-colonialism, um, uh, decolonizing ceramics, things, um, politically and socially engaged, environmentally engaged uh, ceramics. I'm really interested in, for me, I'm interested in sort of pushing those boundaries of ceramics, whereas I'm not that interested in sort of tradition um, because perhaps because I'm a global citizen and I've lived and worked in so many places and I'm not accountable to any one specific sort of authority for creating national narratives. Um, so the way artists approach me is often through, is, is quite organically through social media or responding to a, a something. And that's perhaps the simplest. It's not how everybody is, it, you know, I can't answer this for every single curator, but but I get really excited by those, those exchanges and they often go quite far, those exchanges with artists and I retain them. And um, a bit like Hei Young also, I, when I work with an artist who, who is somebody of great integrity, whose work I respect, I will do everything for them. And, and I know they'll do everything for me. And you have, I have lots of very deep friendships with artists who I try and be as loyal to as possible and who I know will be loyal to me um, and give me their best and never shortchange me. So yes, there, is, there are relationships of trust that are built up over time. Um, built up over shared interests. Um, I've had people, I, I hate being added to people's mailing lists without their permission. Um, please don't, you know, and I think that's the worst way to approach a curator or, yeah. or, or anybody um, is just to add them to your mailing list. I think 
you know, a direct approach saying, I saw you interested in this, or I know your last project con concerned that I'd like to share you my, my most recent work or my think my thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even as Hayong said, I, I also had a couple of handwritten cards and letters with, with a hand printed catalog. Those are, those are things that I treasure. I absolutely treasure mm -hmm. them. Um, even if it's like a one-off edition, which they've sort of hand printed themselves or go into a bit of effort to show that kind of touch. Of course, um, you know, one's absolutely flattered and, and touched by those kind of gestures. Um, it, it doesn't mean that I can include every single artist that I've ever known or appreciate or whose work I love on every show. And for me also, when I work with artists, I, while I, I feel that artists that I'm loyal to, I'm also constantly trying to, and it's a difficult line because you want to work with artists that you trust and you know are, are serious and, and are going to deliver the goods on time and on budget. Um, mm -hmm. And then constantly changing your artists and, and being creative. And I try very hard not to work with artists who are gallery who are galleried and institutional because they don't need me. Um, as an independent curator, I create platforms for, for artists who mm -hmm. aren't institutionalized. And I, and I do take constant risks with um, non-institutional artists and young and emerging artists. And when I say young and emerging, I think it's perhaps more emerging because I've worked with so many really talented artists from some of them are as young as 24 and other people are in their 60s and 70s, but they just never had their lucky break um, and their work is amazing. So, so for me, the question of age doesn't really enter too much into, into the, the, the issue. It's more the question of, is your work consistently interesting? Are you constantly kind of experimenting and trying new things and um, is, is there that spark for me? I don't know. Okay, um... uh, another thing uh, that I also do is I work with universities and we invite some of these curators to give talks. And this is a great way of approaching them. And uh, it has worked tremendously. And we ask them to, we ask the students to ask questions to the curators and uh, the students are really active in this way because the curators of museums work in the field and also in exhibitions. So they ask very interesting questions such as what they're looking for, uh, how they perceive new emerging artists and so on. And it has been a tremendous uh, resource in that way and a good way of connecting you know, with the young people and uh, the curators. And uh, yes, I agree with uh, Wendy. I have no preconceived notion on who I select. I'm always looking for new talents. I'm always looking for a uh, different way of working with artists uh, and also looking at the potential. And I, go, I do go, do my rounds in Korea of visiting the artists, make sure I go and see them every now and then. And um, if a person has not been producing work for a while, I go and see what's wrong with them. Often um, they are in a situation where they've broken up with somebody or going through a hard time or broken in terms of money and so on. So then I try to also help. So basically uh, in my field, uh, I have a lot of love and care for them and um, I think that's the basic way I work. And um, sometimes we talk for a long time and try to see where their work can go in the future. So it, it's a lot of work, uh, uh, which mm. is not so visible. Um, okay, um, yeah. perhaps I'm gonna take a last question and it's from uh, Nuala. And I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I wonder if artists should be careful about limiting the amount of content that they are increasingly under pressure to create for online events and exhibitions. I feel that artists are creating precedents that may be difficult to step back from when we go back to real events. How much time can or should galleries reasonably expect from artists in terms of virtual 
studio visits, video stories, written content, etc. I ask this as I feel it's becoming a major unpaid part of my studio work and time. Understandable at the moment, but I'd rather that it is not carried into the future as a standard expectation. Great question. Great question, Wendy. You, it's over to you. <laughs> I question everybody. Will we be able to return back to the way of life that we lived before? Um, I have read a lot of articles this year and um, the future does not look too bright until 2024. Although the vaccine is coming out, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate even to try it, you know. Um, only thing we can do is eat well, keep our immune systems well, and keep going. I, as the question poses, I don't want it to become the new normal, but um, for now, we still have to survive. Every day is about surviving, even as a curator. Every day is a way of finding new ways to show works, to promote artists, to expose them to the world. Um, I don't like that uh, social media and everything, but again, it's the current trend. I don't like Instagram, uh, but it's the trend. So what can we do? Uh, we, I think as um, playmakers, we are not so good at adapting to what's happening currently to high technology and so on. But if, if the situation requires us to use it, I, I am somebody who would like to use it to the full uh, because that's the only way that we can help each other. So if you're unable to do it yourself, uh, I'm sure someone else who is more uh, uh, good at these skills can do it for you and I'm all for it you know okay I think the question was more in a sense this is unpaid labor and yes it is and perhaps yes, it is yeah. it, it totally yeah. is I think um if it if this becomes a new normal which I think it is it's like grant writing and and I think there's this naive notion that artists spend 80% of their time making art and you know we need to kind of go back to the reality that it's um, a lot of our time as artists um, and curators and independents is spent writing grants and um, that's that doesn't work all over the world and that that is a spe very specific rich country develop and developed nation phenomenon but um if you spending, you know, I, I, my feeling is is that that is that time is in, is associated with your art making practice, and if a piece involves twenty hours of grant writing, social media, or whatever you you know, that is part of the making process. Build it into your piece, put it in your price. It's easy to say that. It's perhaps less easy to to charge those prices, but. Um, the the reality is that, that that time is money, and and I do think that you need to be including um, pre production and post production marketing videos, multimedia, whatever you're doing, um, into the price of your work, and see that your work is not just an object um, or a piece. It's it's a it's the sum of the labor involved in its creation. That's a very good point. Um, it's not just about making the object nowadays. The shift is to see it as a complete package in some ways, you know, and um, it's about you. So, um, yeah, what can I say? I mean, it, it's it's it, for both of us. We are doing extra work also. I know Wendy is doing a considerable amount on the web and uh, same for me. We hardly sleep because we have to make all these contents before we expose it to the world. Um, if you see my Facebook, it's nothing to do about myself, but to uh, all work related, but it's the best way to show um, an easy way, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, 
I, I think we've gone very over time, but the questions and, and discussions have been really amazing. Um, thank you, everybody, for for being here, for showing yeah. up, for thank all you. Your questions. Um, thank you so much. Please don't hesitate to, to reach mm. out to Hey Young and I if you've got any further questions. It's been really, really wonderful, um, Hey Young, learning about um, practices in Korea and some and and particularly learning from your experience as somebody who's done such phenomenal work in the field um, and whose networks are so vast. It's been a yeah. great, great honor. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you so much, Wendy. And I think what Wendy is doing is wonderful for this period. And uh, I think, I believe that ceramics is not something that we can do on our own because, you know, it has so many different processes. So we are part of the process too. So I hope, I can help in any way, you know, too. So, yeah, thank you. Thank Lovely you. Lovely meeting all of you. Yes, and, and I will put this on, on my mm -hmm. um, Ceramics Coach podcast section mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who missed it or would like to share it with uh, students, colleagues, friends, um, etc. Have a great time. Have a great festive season, folks. Um, yeah, Merry <laughs> Christmas and take care. Yes, yes. Have a great holiday. And um, we'll be back in January, probably around the 15th. And I'm going to be looking at sustainable development and green ceramics. And um, please stay tuned for that. Uh, I look forward to, to that. To that. And, and have a great New Year. Lots and lots of great things for everybody. Okay. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.